Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on, guys? We are back with episode 126. Before we start the show, I want to thank our sponsors. The first, again, if you've been following the podcast, is MerrickHealth.com. They are a telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. They do this by two different tracks. They have self-service labs to where you can go to MerrickHealth.com backslash table talk and order a preset lab that you can decide if you just want the labs to ha- you can review with yourself if you know what you're doing or <clears throat> your doctor or you can also get the same thing and get a report and the report will break down where you're at as far as each lab marker that's indicated in there to be able to let you know if it's good bad not so bad and different things that you can go about trying to do to make that better. <clears throat> the second route is guided optimization to where you'll meet with a patient care coordinator. They'll help you to determine which labs to run. And then from there, you'll have those labs done. They'll review the labs and then you'll meet with your uh, hormone specialist slash doctor and they'll determine if you need prescription supplements or whatever to bring your hormones optimized. The second sponsor, obviously, is EliteFTS.com. If you want to support the show, we have limited edition apparel, coffee. What else do we have? Limited edition apparel, coffee, uh, towels, fanny packs, and all kinds of other stuff that if you go to the link in the description, all these items that are listed in the link support the podcast. So that's what I use to kind of determine where we are as far as the podcast goes. The discount code for Merrick and Elite FTS is Table Talk, and with each, you'll save 10% on your first order. So with that in mind, we're going to get on to the show. Today, I got Greg Knuckles with me. Greg is the head of content for Stronger by Science, and he is also the co-owner of Mass, which is a monthly research digest. I have a lot of questions and a lot of things I want to discuss with Greg, but real quick, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the Mass Monthly Research Digest. How long have you guys had that out? Uh, It's been out for a little over five years. Yeah, I think I was one of the, if I wasn't one of the first, it was definitely within the first year. As as I told you earlier, it's one of the best investments that I've ever made. I think anybody that places training is a top four priority Mm -hmm. in their life. If they're not getting that, they're doing themselves a disservice. Well, I I really appreciate it. And I'll also say that uh, there, especially very early on, we were looking at uh, orders as they came in, just like who was subscribing to Mass. And when your name came down like the customer ticker, all of us just collectively lost our minds. We were like, <laughs> oh shit, Dave Tate subscribed. Yeah. That, th- that was the moment we're like, okay, we must be doing something reasonably well, uh, assuming he doesn't cancel next month. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, what, what you guys do and you do so well is, I'm, I'm so, sorry, so far separated mm-hmm. from research. I mean, last time I really looked at solid research when I was studying exercise science in college, I don't even want to go back and tell you what year that was. It was a long time ago, right? <laughs> and then you have... You know, the NSCA journals and uh, whatever, the National Association. What's their journal? The uh, uh, JSCR, yeah, Journal J- of Strength, yeah, and, Conditioning Strength Research. and Conditioning. Yeah. And I would follow those for a while, but as I'm trying to grow a business and doing all these other things, I can't just keep looking at the same the research over and over and over and over. And mm-hmm. aside from that, you got to disseminate it. Mm-hmm. You know, like, is this valid? Is this not valid? And I would show it to people that know research way better than me and say, yeah. oh, this is crap. This is yeah. junk. This isn't... This. And I just got to the point where I don't want to deal with that anymore. Mm-hmm. I just I don't have the time to be able to vet all this out. Then what you guys do is you you sort it all out. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you what, what I want to say. You help me out here. You summarize it, mm-hmm. but not really summarize because some you know when I think of a summary, I think of you know the little one paragraph that yeah. goes at the yeah. end of it. It's, so it's not a summary. It's your 
collecting the data and then giving the results of the, you know, help me. Yeah, and, and trying to provide our take on it and put it in context of the rest of the research. Yes. Um, but yeah, what, what you hit on is basically the reason we made it in the first place. Um, there are four of us, and it takes us, it, it probably takes us an average of eh, 10, 15 hours a week to keep up with the research. Um, and, you know, th it's part of our job. Yeah. And if someone is already working 40, 50 hours a week running a gym, training people, uh, whatever else, you know, that's that if they were doing that for themselves, it, it would basically be asking them to do a part time job on top of their yes. full time job. Uh, so so the biggest thing we're trying to do is just save people that time. And you, and you do, because when I go through it just personally now, each time it comes out, you know, it's, I'm, I'm old school, so when it comes out, I download the PDF, then I mm -hmm. drag it into my iBooks thing, and there it is, nice. right? So as I'm going through, or I'll print it out if, there, if there's more than, because usually I'll go through, I'm like, interested, interested, not, 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 because mm -hmm. you guys break it down really well. Each month, there's always something mm -hmm. that I'm interested in. There's other ones like, ah, not right now, maybe a certain time. Yeah. Now, if there's more, like three or four things, then I print it out, and it's like, you know, that much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they're all sitting out there in the office there, and... Um, then I can go through and I get that really quick. It doesn't take me very, because I'm skim reading most of it. Mm -hmm. So it takes me no more than a half hour. Yeah. You know, just kind of skim read, go through there. And it's like, oh, I didn't think of that or I forgot about that or this is interesting. You mm -hmm. know, and it's, it's it's a great service that you guys are doing. So it's I'm that's part of the reason why I bring, wanted to bring you out here. Because I truly do believe that everybody that's listening to this thing should subscribe to it. They really should because it's going to answer so many of their questions and at mm -hmm. least or make them ask better questions yeah that's that, that's <laughs> that, that's ultimately what we're going for I yes think. yeah yes with your i want to get into your background a little bit because I, I did a little i mean we got some other stuff too like some low-hanging things here mm -hmm. like people want like what's up with the beard like everybody I, there's like many comments of now that it's summer are you going to shave the beard um, I, I did shave my beard. It's it's, <laughs> it's currently shaved. What what more do people want from me? I don't know. Like, was it was it like longer? And now that I, I don't, there was like the beard and the baking thing, which like two of these things kind of like popped up. Like, okay, I got to ask about these. You know, so sure. Uh, so I don't even know what to ask about the the beard. the beard. I would say is almost like a very niche cultural thing. Uh, Knuckles men all have beards and. <laughs> As I was growing up, the thought never entered my mind that I wouldn't be a bearded man. Um, but yeah, the the biggest advantage of it is it it saves time. Uh, I let it grow for. I trim my beard about two or three times a year, so I'll let it go till it's four or five inches long. Trim it down until it's a little shorter than it currently is. Uh, you know, trim my mustache about once a month. Trim my neck about every two mm -hmm. weeks, and that's it. Um, otherwise, it grows fast enough that if I wanted it to be smooth smooth i need to shave every day or up to twice a day uh which is just completely untenable so mm -hmm. yeah it, it's it's mostly to save time yeah <laughs> so there there you guys go yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know where the beard questions come from now what about the baking thing i like baking <laughs> uh i i think it's fun i i mean it's it's ultimately my hobby um i'm a i'm a very social person we we have friends over for uh, essentially a potluck every Saturday, and I like cooking a good meal for friends. So, I don't know. Have you always been that way? I would say I have. Um, I, I've i always liked doing little things with my hands, like just little crafts and whatnot. Um, and so baking and just cooking generally is, is a very tactile thing. Um, you can actually eat what, what you finish <laughs> up with instead of just having some little, like, craft doohickey. Um, so yeah, it's it's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you now to pivot back into the, the training thing? Like, when did you first start training? See, so well, because you competed in fifteen, right? Mm -hmm. So, did you is did you find training and then end up competing? Because that's how it happened with me. I ended mm -hmm. up doing pretty quick. Or were you training before that? Uh, hmm. so I, I guess it kind of de depends how you define training. So my my weight training. Uh, so my entire mother's side of my family are very large, outrageously strong people. And I just always thought that was very cool. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so like, even as a little kid, like I, I grew up out in the woods and I would just go out in the woods and try to figure out like, what's the biggest log I can pick up. Um, I asked my parents for a weight set for uh, Christmas when I was 10 years old. And I ended up not using it very much because my parents were just positive that weight training was very dangerous. So they wouldn't let me work out unless mm -hmm. one of them was down there kind of watching me and making sure I wasn't doing any, doing anything dumb. And, you know, they don't, they don't want to spend two hours in the basement watching me lift weights every night. Uh, so that weight set didn't get a ton of usage. So I would say that I started training somewhat consistently the summer before my freshman year of high school working out for football. Okay. Yeah. And that would, that would be around 14, 15, right? Uh, like I, yeah, I, I think 13. Do, do you turn 14 your freshman year or do you turn 15? I don't know. I think it's whatever. Well, whatever. whatever. Like so, 13, 14, thereabouts. A couple of years before you yeah. competed then. Yeah. What, <clears throat> how were you introduced into powerlifting? So uh, it was completely by chance. So I, I started lifting for like summer workouts for football. But my main sport growing up was basketball. I loved and still absolutely adore basketball. Um, and, you know, I'm maybe 5'10 on a good day. Uh, and I wanted to get more verticality to my game. So I, at my very best, I could, I could barely dunk if I got just the absolutely perfect run up. And more than anything, like, you know, I wanted to be able to play better vertical defense, rebound better. Mm -hmm. But I really, like, more than anything, you know, kind of vain teenage training goal, I wanted to be able to consistently dunk on fast breaks like that. That was yeah. that was what got me really serious about lifting. And uh, so I go to the local gym in Little Moxville, North Carolina, uh, you know, try to try to get coaching for that. And it just so happens that Travis Mash was coaching at the gym at the time. And so, you know, I said, hey, I want to jump higher. Travis said, sure, I can help you with that. And then the next summer at football camp, I got a catastrophically bad concussion like the the type where the doctors were like you you can't do anything with a contact element for at least six months mm -hmm. so that knocked me out of football season and it knocked me out of basketball season i was i was pretty dejected about it and travis said i think you're better at lifting weights than you were at sports like other sport like team sports anyways uh so there's this sport called powerlifting, uh and we're actually going to be holding a meet at the gym in a couple months why don't you train for that? So that was that was my introduction to the sport. All right, and then you you competed from like I think I have it down here 07 through 08. Is mm -hmm. that about right? And then there was a gap. Mm -hmm. And was that college or what? That was that was a random injury that I still haven't ever completely gotten over from. So uh, it, it was a very random thing, uh, and it sounds unbelievable but i promise this is 100 percent <laughs> true the first time i ever pulled 600 pounds it was in the gym uh i locked it out i w i felt like the king of the world so i was just holding it there at lockout for you know basically until my grip was going to give out just yeah. to kind of drink in the moment and some absolute jabroni is walking through the weight room you know earphones on not paying attention to anything and he just bumps into the side of the bar and i felt a pop in my lower back uh, don't know if there was like disc damage, definitely tore my QL. Um, and, you know, so then I dropped the weight and unloaded it. And uh, like I had to go to two or three PTs and, and they were all like, oh, I think you have sciatica. I'm like, I don't have sciatica. Mm -hmm. I don't like, you know, I'm I'm still a teenager at this point. Like I probably didn't articulate myself the best. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I, I've I've Googled sciatica symptoms. I don't have shooting pain down my leg. Like it's just localized to my mm -hmm. lower back. Um, so I couldn't convince a PT to actually rule out the sciatica diagnosis until over a year later. And so like, I, I, I kind of think that that injury just kind of marinated long enough that it never completely healed properly. Um, but I, I've learned to manage it better over time. And I, I started competing again once, once I figured out how to manage it well enough that I could train somewhat consistently again. All right. So that, I think that brings us to like 20. 12 yeah right and then that was a i mean that that's when you hit your biggest totals or biggest lifts right yeah from 20, 2012 20, 20, to 2013 um my, then, my biggest lifts on on the platform yeah well wait a minute so you've been i assume the biggest lifts. you've done the bigger lifts after that in the gym 
Yeah, so I, I assume you're also going to jump to my very bad meet and no, I'm not. I was no, I was gonna. I can't no, go we, there. We can yeah, go we can there. Go it's there. it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I was kind of hoping that that would be my last meet and I could go out on a high note. Yeah. So I was, I was all ready to rock for a two thousand total, and and that was that was my ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, I mean, my ultimate goal when I got into the sport is. You know, I, I wanted to be I wanted to be like the first person to total twenty six hundred raw or whatever. Yeah. And then I realized, OK, that's not going to be in the cards. So, uh, you know, I wanted to total two thousand and leading up to that meet, everything seemed to be aligning. Uh, and then I just like re-aggravated my back like five days out from the meet. Um, and so, you know, I, I still competed because I'd already registered. But uh but yeah, so I, I had I had hit some pretty big numbers in the gym leading up to that meet, but my my biggest on the platform was was early 2013. Yeah, I mean where where I was going is you have you know like a two three solid years yeah. competing, and then gap, and then two mm-hmm. to three solid years of competing, then gap. Yeah. So like, when's the next two to three solid years of competing, <laughs> or is it just is that in, in the rear view? Well, you know, so I'm I'm currently trying to lose weight. Yeah. Uh, trying to get down sub 200 again after previously being entirely too big, um, and and I do think it would try. I, I do think it would be fun to try to beat my 242 numbers at 198 uh, mm-hmm. once I get down there. So who knows? Maybe maybe in another couple of years, but we'll see. So I say it never goes away, does it? No, not really. <laughs> so you always think, you know, there's that one more. Or you can do this. How much? How much weight have you pulled off? Uh, so the biggest the biggest squats I've hit, I did 750 for a double and 765, pretty comfortable, uh, both both with knee wraps. Uh, benched 485 and pulled 735. Yeah, those are respectable. How much weight have you lost? Uh, so I body, got body weight. I, I got up to 278, and I'm like mid 220s now. And this is just on this last, yeah, diet, or I, lifestyle change. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. like the word diet. You yeah, know, because so that's so that's what fifty. Yeah, right yeah, it's, it's like 53, 54 pounds. Yeah, yeah. So has your life completely changed from where it was to be able to do that? Um. In, in some ways it has, in some ways it hasn't. Uh, so th- this is m- maybe not advice that anyone should take or that anyone listening to this would yeah. take. But the probably the most important thing for me personally to be able to lose the weight was to kind of put powerlifting on the back burner. Because one of the things that would, that would always get me before is I could lose, like I, I was... Like, I think such a big part of my personality was tied up in being strong and feeling strong that I could lose 10, maybe 15 pounds and everything would be going fine. And then as soon as the numbers on the bar started going down, it was, you know, it, it was like there was a war within me. And it's like, do I want to keep dieting or, or do I want to just be strong again mm-hmm. and get stronger? Uh, and generally the the desire to maintain my strength and keep getting stronger was was a stronger motivation so I, I just kind of abort the diet and after doing that about half a dozen times I finally realized I, I kind of need to just not worry about powerlifting for a while so I can lose the weight and then you know pick it back up and you know I, I think that that might on a physiological basis be bad advice because you know training hard when you're dieting helps you preserve lean mass mm-hmm. be in a better place when you're done with the diet but I found for me, at least psychologically, like I, I just couldn't do that because I, I just couldn't bear to see the numbers keep going yeah. down. I've yeah. always been the same way. Yeah. So anytime that I knew that I had to pull weight off, mm-hmm. I, I would find I, I would find exercises or make them up mm-hmm. that I didn't know if I was good or bad at. Yeah. So then I would strain, say, if it was max effort or I did a heavy single and I would sit there and think to myself, <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> you know, is that good or is that not good? Yeah. And then just hope nobody else came in the gym and did it for five. You yeah, know, yeah. To, to like show me that it really isn't mm-hmm. you know a good thing. So I can I can definitely relate with what you're saying there because there is, you know, there's leverages that change and mm-hmm. you know fluid retention. There's other things that factor into that, but it's <laughs> the question that comes there is, and I can already see the questions you know coming like well i thought you could maintain all your strength as you lose weight and kind of yeah <laughs> you know it, it depends upon a lot of factors and a lot of variables mm-hmm. from there um 
have you changed? Are, are you still training heavy? Uh, not particularly. Okay. So I've, I've been doing, it, it's, it's similar to what you were just describing, but kind of with more just sort of like bodybuilder style training. So uh, lighter weights, uh, lighter weights to some extent, higher reps. And then essentially what I do is I'll pick a new exercise, do it for four or five weeks. Numbers go up just because I'm getting good at the lift. And then once the numbers start going down because I'm losing weight, I just pick a new lift and, yeah. and keep going. That's pretty much what I do. Yeah. <laughs> you just take those low hanging adaptations. Yeah. I'm stronger. There you go from yeah. there. And um, when when did you get into the um, wanting to figure out why, like the research part of this? I would say probably, probably in college, maybe like 2011, 2012. Um, I, I I got into training for the sport in like 2005. Uh, he, well, here, here's actually something that someone could use to date it. Uh, as soon as I decided, okay, I'm going to do powerlifting, I subscribed to Powerlifting USA. And the first issue I got was the one where Andy Bolton had just squatted 1213. So that, that seared into my mind. <laughs> that was, that was my genesis yeah. in powerlifting. And so there for a few years, I just tried to consume all of the information I could get my hands on. And one of the things that was consistently frustrating was there were a lot of very big, strong, successful people saying very different things. And, and you know, my, my knee jerk response is like, eh, they could all be true to some extent, but there was no, like I, I didn't have a rubric to kind of grade what was more right and what was more wrong. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, one of the appeals of getting into science was like, you are like, there, there is at least a mechanism to try to get at, um, some sort of generalizable truth to kind of adjudicate that stuff a little better. So I, I think that was the first thing that that got me interested in getting into science. Um, like just because there was so much conflicting information and I, I wanted a way to be able to kind of sort through it. Conflicting information on, on what spectrums, obviously, you know, the gym bro, you know, mm -hmm. the gym information, the stuff you're seeing there, but was it also conflicting information on the science side as well. Well, so I, I didn't know anything about okay, the science okay, side of okay, stuff. Okay, that's right. All right. Um, but so, so like one one great example yeah. is, and, and you know, I'm obviously on your podcast right now. Yeah. I mean this sincerely, yeah. not to blow smoke up your ass, but you and Elite FTS yeah. were were like far and away my number one mm -hmm. source of information early on. But then, like, there were other guys who at least purported to to base their training methods on scientific stuff. Like, a, a lot of your guys' yeah. stuff came from West Side, and so mm -hmm. the Russian stuff. Um, but then I remember, like, reading interviews with Marty Gallagher, mm -hmm. who would say, like, oh, yeah, the, the way that, like, Ed Cohn trained and the I, way I we trained a lot of those guys, yeah. it was based on solid scientific principles that, at least to me, seemed quite different from mm -hmm. West Side principles. Yes. Um, and so, you know, in, in my little like 16, 17 year old brain. I was like, but, but which one is no, better? I, no, you know? I get where you're going now because even with the stuff that we're putting out, we'd have the conjugate stuff. Then there would be block yeah. stuff. Then there would be the linear stuff. And mm -hmm. then occasionally the bodybuilding stuff. And I could see if you're a teenager, you're like, uh, yeah. Like what is going on, yeah. you know, with all this. And then, so as you got pulled into, into that, cause it, my story is kind of the same when I was through college and it was, it was, nutrition and exercise science both mm -hmm. and because like okay now what the hell you know because everybody's telling me all these different things mm -hmm. and then a lot of things just stop working and i was not smart enough to realize you know the longer you do something you know mm -hmm. the, the harder it is yeah. to be able to keep progressing to my mind i didn't want to accept that <laughs> it was mm -hmm. just things that i didn't know and then so i wanted to find answers mm -hmm. you know that were more tangible and just through say new nutritional biochem for instance i'm like oh so that's what happens with you know protein going all the way through your system until mm -hmm. it comes back out mm -hmm. and i'm like okay all those guys are just in the gym are dumb you know they they don't you know, they know. Yeah. so now I, I have like flipped all the way over you know on this other side and then it it was then on that other side it became well this is whacked you mm -hmm. know because it's 
the application, you mm -hmm. know, was kind of lacking. And then obviously I just go back on the other side and try to maintain somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm sure at some point as you were going through, because you have your master's in exercise science, I yeah. believe, right? As you're going through there, you start to see what I saw. And it's, there's, I don't even know how to, there's a mess everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I saw that mess and I didn't look any further to see the, the clean, you know what I'm saying? The, mm -hmm. That part, I just said, screw it. It mm -hmm. just went the other way. What made you say, this is where I want to stay? Um, Cause keep in mind, you're still lifting at the same time. So you, you're yeah. living the art, right? Let's mm -hmm. just say the art and yeah, you got a book, the art of science, yeah. it's, you have those two. So you're living the art and the science part mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, you know, so I, I think I, I think I fell into it almost by accident. Um, so I, I, I was planning after graduation to just go, uh, go back to, to North Carolina and keep coaching for Travis Mash. Like I, I previously, like over the summer has been working at his gym. And so that was my post-graduation plan. Um, my wife and I got married in college and she was a journalism major and she got a really, really prestigious journalism internship after graduation, uh, but it was in California. So, you know, we, we didn't want to live apart for a few years, mm -hmm. kind of hard to swing the California to North Carolina commute. <laughs> yeah. um, so we decided to go out to California. And so she was guaranteed, I believe either 10 or 12 weeks. And I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't walk into a gym and say with a straight face, like, hey, I might be gone in two months, but mm -hmm. please give me a job. So that, that kind of put me down the road of, uh, of online coaching and content creation mm -hmm. more so than doing a ton of coaching in person. And so, you know, I, I think that it's really important to write and, and make information from a perspective of what things, what things can you credibly talk about? And so I certainly had experience and have experience doing a lot of coaching and a lot of hands-on stuff. Um, but you know, we're talking, we're talking three or four years. We're not talking decades and decades. Uh, so what I could talk about is my own experiences, my experiences working with clients online and, you know, just other sources of information I had access to and could learn from and distill from. And so, you know, it was either go into the scientific literature and try to, you know, try to pull out insights that people might find interesting or just read stuff from other coaches and parrot it. But there's, there's already a whole content industry of, yeah. of people parroting you, yes, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Um, and so I, I didn't want to just be another one of those guys. So since, since I was kind of just by chance pushed towards doing the content thing, um, you know, writing about scientific stuff seemed to be the only way that I could, like, add unique value and not just parrot stuff uh, from other people, but also write, write in a way that was actually credible. Um, and not try to make it sound like I'd been coaching people for 20 years and was yeah, an expert yeah. coach. When, when did you see that there was this big gap in the industry to be able to facilitate the difference between the research and what you know people like myself would mm -hmm. read? Um, can, can you rephrase the question? Because I, I think uh, well, I know what you're asking, but yeah, I'm not it's, sure. There's a, there was a gap, and I think mm -hmm. you guys filled it, right? And you fill it with your writing. There was a gap in the industry between if I'm going to read this article, which is very, very heavily science mm -hmm. cited and science based and without being opinion, mm -hmm. you know, because you can have science. We, we see this th thousands of times. You can have a, a whole opinion piece with a lot of citations yeah. that yeah. actually aren't even used mm -hmm. there. I think they're just copy and pasted to put it. Mm -hmm. You see where I'm so. OK, so this is kind of going where I'm yeah, yeah. asking. Right. So you would have all those articles, per se, that have all these citations, which mm -hmm. I think are just copy and pasted from other articles that they've done before that aren't really in there. Yeah. But then you're creating pieces that are actually citing having the citations in there, but then laying it out in such a way that might be slight opinion, but not. Yeah. But you, so. Yeah, yeah. So that I, was I, missing. So I, I think the, I, I think the biggest gap is there just weren't, there weren't many people who, really had a foot in both worlds. Yes. Um, so you know I, I was lifting at a pretty high level. 
I, I was still coaching people at a reasonably high level. Um, and I was also very interested in research. And I, I think that uh, at, now there are more people uh, who that would describe. But back then in 2012, 2013, there, there weren't many. Hmm. Um, and so I think that ultimately, if you're going to make scientific information useful and actionable to lifters, you need to know what lifters care about. You know, like you, you need to be able to frame a scientific discussion um, you know, with, with background information and context about what the kind of bro chatter about a particular topic is. So you're, you're both going to know what's interesting, uh, like what people will actually want to read, and you'll be able to read science with, with more of like a practical lens, um, you know, because you, you read some study protocols and you're like, okay, this is an interesting finding, but I would never prescribe anything like that to my lifter. So yes. uh, d to what extent is this generalizable? And so I, I think you, you need sort of that like real world lifter coach type filter to be able to make scientific information useful to coaches and lifters. Yes. Yeah, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is <clears throat> from, from the information that I've seen from you even early on and, and, and now is you remove your bias, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, you may not even have a bias anymore, right? I mean, I I don't think I yeah, I, th yeah. I think it's impossible to remove your bias. Yeah. yeah, but more so than let's say if I was to write here's this conjugate plan, then I'm mm -hmm. going to write it with my 100% full bias. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to go find citations to be able to validate mm -hmm. everything that I just put in there, which is all my bias, right? Mm -hmm. That was the majority of the content that they would say was oh, yeah, sci yeah. science oriented yeah. then, right? Now the ones that just said, oh, fuck it, I am doing that. I'm just gonna write this and here's just an opinion piece. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I've, I've never had a problem with that. That's just fine. Now when they're trying to you know, quote all this crap, yeah. you, that, that's what I'm saying is back then that was the majority of the science mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. was just their bias trying to go find things to support it instead of here's this, yeah. you know, figure it out, you mm -hmm. know, and kind of put it out there and with with that in mind what was the there had to be a tipping point like yeah. one topic that you were looking at that you really saw wow this is really cool interesting or this is what I want to do hmm I don't know if one particular topic is coming to mind. I, I wrote I wrote a lot about squat biomechanics yeah. early on. That that may be one thing, um, but I think that I think that one thing that's important if if you want to write about science at least somewhat objectively is there's there's kind of a social pressure to to confirm your biases if you're already like kind of pegged as an X guy. Yeah. You know, like if if you're if you're a West Side guy yeah. and you have built an entire audience around writing about West Side stuff and that's what they want from you and that's what they expect from you and you dig into the scientific literature and decide like, oh, there's some aspect about West Side training that is not just unvalidated by the science but is contradicted by the mm -hmm. science, then whether consciously or not, I think you know on some level that if you write that article or make that video or whatever and say like, Hey, like West Side overall is good, but like Louie was just just completely ass backwards about this one thing. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get a ton of pushback from oh, for course. that, and your audience is going to be alienated at least to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and so, something I tried very hard to do, and I think I succeeded partially, but also failed to some extent, um, was to try to not let myself be tied to one single training ideology mm -hmm. or build an audience writing about one general topic because then I knew I would, I would pigeonhole myself into being that guy. Oh, you and, did. Then, and then yeah. I would be like expected to, to just keep validating that idea forever. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that, I think that if you publicly come out too strong for any particular idea, there, there's just more and more pressure to keep going down that road 
uh, even if it involves cherry picking or distorting research to make it look better. And, and you know, not saying that that's irreversible and, and you have to do that forever, but it just gets harder and harder to be objective the further you go down that road. Oh, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm in that road, yeah. right? So it's, I mean, very, very quickly I was caught up you know, in that road. And because a lot of it in the very beginning was deciphering what Louis was, or trying to decipher what Louis mm -hmm. was doing the best that I possibly could. And then, you know, as years go on, it's, you know, if, if people speak to me more about training, it's way more block centric mm -hmm. than it is conjugate centric. But yeah. if I even lay out what I'm talking about and the phasic structures that I'm talking about, they'll still say what I'm saying is 100% yeah. West side conjugate. And it's, kind of not you know but mm -hmm. that's but i don't i don't sell content right yeah. so i don't so it, i don't give a shit because it mm -hmm. doesn't make any difference one way or another where what you're talking about really comes to the surface is when that person has programs or books mm -hmm. or seminars or content all tied to that mm -hmm. then it becomes very hard for them to make their service better mm -hmm. because it becomes rooted and stuck in that. Yeah. So, so one, one place where I saw that very early on, um, was my, my first world record total at 220. Uh, I set that after doing a block of Bulgarian, eh, quote unquote, Bulgarian style training. Like Spazov? Uh, no, no. So like, uh, Oh, I'm so bad with names. Um, I want to say Arabadziev, but that's a that's a EMG researcher. Okay. Um, uh, like, well, were you were you working up maxing out? Were you working up maxing out, then doing percentages of that max, and then on yeah, the whole yeah. same day? Okay. All yeah. Right. So um, oh, <laughs> so I I'd read uh, I I read stuff from John Bros mm -hmm. who who had brought uh, Abajayev's met methods over to the U.S. Um, I talked a little bit with Max Ada, who had mm -hmm. gone over to Bulgaria to train with with Abijayev. Um and you know I thought this seems interesting. And people were saying like there there's no way this could work for powerlifting, uh, weightlifting, powerlifting, very different sports. There's a much greater eccentric component of powerlifting training. So if you're working up to maxes all the time, it's going to cause way more muscle damage. It's going to be harder to recover from mm -hmm. than doing max clean and jerks and snatches every day. But I, I looked at what the Bulgarians were doing, and it's like, well, that's true to some extent. Like, they are doing max clean and jerks and snatches, but they're also doing max squats and front squats. Mm -hmm. And they were stupidly strong squatters. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I realized pretty early on I couldn't work up to a max deadlift every day. I gave that a shot. Didn't go well. Um, but, I, but I worked up to a max squat and bench every day, uh, sometimes multiple times per day, did some back off work. And for me, at least, it worked really well. And so I, I wrote about that and, you know, didn't say, I never said, you should do this yeah, style yeah, of training. Yeah, yeah. But I said, hey, I, I gave this a shot. It was fun. I liked yeah. it a lot. I like maxing. Um, so, you know, if you want to give this style of training a shot, this is how you might want to set it up. Mm -hmm. And so pretty quickly, people started trying to peg me as like the Bulgarian method okay. guy. Um, and, and I realized that I was starting to go down that road. And I just said, nope, I'm hitting the abort button. I'm not going to talk about this yeah. anymore because I, I don't want to get pigeonholed like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, want, I want all of my options open to me. Yeah, that's a, a smart move. It's a, I did something kind of similar to that when I was in college, and it was based upon what Angel Spazoff put in the NSCA journal when he mm -hmm. came over to visit. And it was... It was it was four it was four weeks or so three times a week but mm -hmm. I do remember you, each how I mean, the squat the squat session took three and a half hours to complete I mean it was insane and um, I almost hesitate to see this or say this but I don't think people are going to be able to find it so whatever you know it put like seventy pounds on my squat yeah in a month. I'm like this is the greatest thing ever but I can never do it again no yeah I mean it, that <laughs> that is the program that made me a good squatter like I, I was. I was always a decent deadlifter, decent bencher, terrible squatter. Um, like the the lift, the lift just didn't make sense to my body. Like my my kinesthetic sense for the squat was just complete shit. Um, but you know, turns out if you max on the squat multiple times per day, you kind of have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe you just break yourself. But I I figured it out. Yeah. Um, 
And so, yeah, it, it took my squat from like 545 to 650 in like 10 weeks. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the best thing I ever did for my squat. <laughs> No, let's peel that back just a little bit for people, right? So, um, there's there's several adaptations that probably occurred, mm -hmm. you know, during that time. You know, you became more proficient at lifting heavier weights, mm -hmm. right? So, there's there's other components. Cause we don't need people to go do max it out three times. I can just see, you know, oh, yeah. you know it's just where this is going to lead from there. But actually, I'll just I'll just. <laughs> I'll pivot off of that. I know. Let's let's stay there. So with that, right? So let's just break this down into a science level. Mm -hmm. Like, what what attributes, or if that's the right word, um, what characteristics do you think that program provided mm -hmm. for you to be able to get that progress? Uh, I think I think a few things. One, it it really forced me to figure out a squat technique that worked well for my body and my leverages. Um, like I, I have, I mean, I, I think I have a kind of typical squat stance for a multiply lifter, but I compete raw. Yeah, you do. Um, <laughs> and so I, I had always been told like, yeah, that's, that's not the right way to squat. But uh, I, I got feedback from my body with technique if I was maxing multiple times per day every day, uh, where if I was squatting in a way that didn't, agree with my body it would tell me like i would just hurt and ache everywhere mm -hmm. um and so that that kind of you know i i think i would have reached the same place regardless but i think a, a troubleshooting process that otherwise would have taken me six months or a year that quite frankly i should have already done in my training yeah. career um you know ended up taking me a month and a half so yeah. I, I think it just just expedited or expedited that troubleshooting process and, and then the other thing is, I think it got me really, really good at grinding where, um, you know, previously when I would reach the sticking point, I would typically just get there and fail because mm -hmm. I'd get to the sticking point in a really bad position and I wasn't great at negotiating my way through it and like figuring out how to fight through a really heavy squat. Um, and, you know, I, just by getting a ton of practice doing those maxes, uh, it, it taught me that specific skill of how to get through a really heavy squat, which again, I, I think that, um, I, I think that it essentially got me to a place that I would have gotten to in like two years mm -hmm. in two months. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking is that when you push that all in there, cause two of the, some of the things that are the hardest skills to acquire is that grinding because mm -hmm. you hit it and you think you're done yeah but you don't know you can yeah and how do you learn that yeah <laughs> right and then the technical part you know having that all crunched in there like that you're going to know if you don't recover yeah and then you're going to start to kind of like figure out well i got to do this or this and this or if the rep doesn't feel right mm -hmm. like well that and there's so many sets mm -hmm. you know so there's there's that so i i've I agree with what you, you know, it pushes it down in there where that's what I think it did for me as well with the heavier weights mm -hmm. was that because you really, I mean, if you look at a lot of the training programs, you're really not getting under the heavier weights and the specificity of the lift that you're competing in mm -hmm. that much over a quarter of a year. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's none, you know, in certain quarters of the year. Now you force yourself to that. The, when I came out the back end, it was like, oh, God, do I want to do this again? I mean, it was, it, there was that whole thing to where I can see the the criticism against the Bulgarian style of mm -hmm. burning lifters out and all that other kind of stuff. I can mm -hmm. I can see where that's coming from because if you if you have a life, you know, and other things that you're trying to do, it's just mentally, though, I don't know how. Oh yeah, yeah I mean, so I just... I was doing that at 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um I don't I don't think I could do that today. Yeah. And uh so I, I was doing that over a summer when I was home from school. I was coaching at Travis's gym. I'd go in in the morning, get in my first squat session, uh train lifters through the afternoon, once or or train athletes through the afternoon. Once they were gone, I would get in my second squat session, uh just eat eat dinner at the gym. And then my wife and her sister would come in to lift late at night, and I would generally do my third session then. And then I'd go home and sleep for 10 to 13 hours and repeat the process. Mm -hmm. uh, 
which worked really, really well oh, yeah. when, when my life allowed me to do that. Mm-hmm. Then I went back to school in the fall. And I mean, like, co- college isn't the same thing as a full-time job. Like, you, you're, you are going to class and studying, but there's still a fair bit of time to work out, like, yeah. do whatever you want. Um, but just from, just from having my, my schedule crunched a little bit more, uh, like, I, I dropped from two sessions or from three sessions a day to two, and my sleep dropped from probably an average of 11 hours a night to nine. But, you know, it was still a very good situation for being able to train a lot. But even just that, that small perturbation made it, like, took the Bulgarian stuff from being really productive, very tenable, to, like, hitting a wall within mm-hmm. a month of trying to train like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, you know, going from sleeping 11 to 9 hours a night, if you're not sleeping... If you can't definitely sleep at least nine hours a night, I wouldn't recommend even yeah. trying it. Because e- like even at 20, and even after already being previously conditioned to train in that style yeah. for the previous few months, just from having my capacity to recover constrained a little bit, it suddenly became untenable. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's definitely like a high risk, moderate to high reward strategy that if all of the stars are aligned for you to be able to do it, you know, may, may be worth playing around with for fun. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't, like 99% of people just don't have the life circumstances uh, to to take an honest shot at it, I think. Okay. The w- one thing I want to talk about is um, percentages, RPE, mm-hmm. RIR. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different names for kind of the same thing. Yeah. But... I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing first. So I, I want to talk about, because this can also be sets of eight, 10, you know, and stuff like that. So let's just set that aside mm-hmm. and it's just singles, right? So I define intensity as percentage of a one rep max, mm-hmm. you know, not effort. And you know, effort would be like pushing that set. One of the things that I have a hard time trying to explain to people is, you know, a percentage for say a 70% for a beginner is not going to be the same as a 70% for an advanced. Yeah. And I think the way that some people are trying to navigate their way around that is, okay, it's not 70%. Let's just say it's a seven RPE mm-hmm. or a seven RII or whatever it's going to be mm-hmm. and trying to, but to me, when you're dealing with just that side, not the multiple reps, they're kind of all talking the same thing, but there's still variants, mm-hmm. right? where the one thing I learned as a trainer early on, and it was when I was at Westside, I was training a female soccer player at the corporate place I was at and had her max out and it wasn't a lot, it's like a hundred pounds. Mm-hmm. And then peeled it down to 80 pounds and she did 20 reps. Yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, wait a minute, 80% for 20? Yeah. That's fucking insane, I could do like two. You yeah. know, maybe five. So there's, there's, you see what there's this big gap. Mm-hmm. So what I try to help people with when, I, when to navigate all the different programs that are out there, because there's a lot of programs and they're all percent based, mm-hmm. is that variance. Like, how does that, first off, let's, you know, talk about why there is that variance, mm-hmm. you know, and then how they can go about gauging where they should or how they should regulate the programs that are out there. Yeah. I, I don't want to call out any programs, right? But mm-hmm. everybody knows there's a lot of programs out there that are percent based mm-hmm. and people are taking those that are just high school kids mm-hmm. and applying those percents or taking them that are, you know, intermediate mm-hmm. in the same thing. So what's your take on that? Like that variance, why is that variance there? Mm-hmm. Or am I wrong? And people should just do the percent. Oh no, you're a you're hundred percent okay. right. Um, so I, I think that variance exists for three, pr- three predominant reasons. One is just, just like, uh, like metabolic differences between individuals almost. So, you know, if, if someone is in, is in good shape, has maybe a super high percentage of type one muscle fibers is reasonably well-trained, but you know, like if, if you take two people and, everything is the same about them, but one of them has a respectable 5K time and the other person gets out of breath walking upstairs, 
the first person is probably going to be able to do more reps with any given percentage of their one rep max, just because like a single set of resistance training, like with reasonably heavy loads is like surprisingly metabolically taxing. So just being in decent shape tends to help your strength endurance. Um, Experience level is going to matter a lot, especially for very, very brand new lifters, largely because like if you're basing percentages off of a one rep max and someone just sucks at maxing, that's not like a true one rep max, if that yes, makes sense. Yes. Like if someone's if someone's strong enough to squat like that, that uh, athlete you talked about, if she was strong enough to squat 150, but she just wasn't good at squatting. So she gets 100, but fails 110. Um you know, then 80 pounds isn't really 80%. It is 80% of the max she hit that day, but it's, you know, closer to 50, like, like 55, 60% of her real max, just because her, her one rep max just isn't a good number. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another thing that's going to matter a lot is just like how, how strong someone is. Cause what, one thing you tend to see is that the number of reps that someone can do with a particular low or a, a particular percentage tends to decrease as their strength increases. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that kind of kind of looping back to how metabolically taxing lifting is, is um, like I, I think I think people don't 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 fully understand. Like I'm sure I'm sure you've seen this with a lot of lifters. If someone's 10 rep max squat is 600 pounds they're they're dead after that yeah, like they're, yeah. they're gonna be it doesn't matter how good of shape they're in they complete that 10th rep grind it out they're gonna be laying on the ground for five ten minutes mm -hmm. if someone's 10 rep max squat is 135 pounds no matter how hard they fight on that last rep like they're gonna be out of breath at the end of the set but they're gonna be fine and they could get back under the bar in two minutes mm -hmm. um and the big reason for that is the the metabolic cost of a set a workout whatever scales with the sheer amount of just physical work being done like work in the physics sense like how many how many joules of work are you completing and so assuming range of motion is similar that's going to scale linearly with weight on the bar and so a set of 10 with 600 is three times as many calories as a set of 10 with 200. Um, and when someone's reasonably weak that's not going to be that big of a consideration but when someone's pretty strong, like that's that's going to be a pretty big deal. So there was a, mm, a study by Escamilla uh, looking at the energy cost of deadlifting. And if memory serves in that study, people were deadlifting uh, like 175 kilos. So like three, 380, something like that for a set of either eight or 10 reps. And the total energy cost of that was like 10 calories give or take and 10 calories may not sound like much but that's that's equivalent to like running about a tenth of a mile for someone who's in reasonably good shape um and so you know th that's like sprinting 200 meters essentially and so you know if you're pretty fast you can run 200 meters in like 25 30 seconds and, and you're going to be dead afterwards and so if you're completing that set of eight dead, uh, that set of eight reps on the deadlift with 380 pounds, that's a similar energy cost. And so if you're doing it in a similar amount of time, it's going to affect you metabolically the same way. And if, if you see a two, 400 meter runner after a race, like they're, they're pretty toasted. But then if you scale that up and now instead of doing 380 pounds for a set of eight, if that's six, 700 pounds for a set of eight, and you're still doing it in, you know, 20, 30 seconds, you know, now suddenly that's, that's the metabolic cost of sprinting over 400 meters in the same amount of time that it would take a good sprinter to sprint 200 meters. Mm -hmm. And you're just accruing so much anaerobic debt when you're doing that, it, it just wipes you out. Um, and so going back to the question of like rep maxes, like that's, that's a dynamic in play. As people mm -hmm. get stronger and stronger, especially not if they're, if, if they're not in particularly great shape, you know, you see them under a bar squatting, but the way their, their metabolic system is processing that it's like, it's like they're sprinting, you know, yes. and they're sprinting mm -hmm. really fucking fast mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, doesn't take that many reps with that heavy of a weight, 
before, you know, your, your metabolic system can give out before your actual muscles do, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that the, the actual physical constraint for a set to failure is, is probably different for really strong people and still strong, but not super strong folks and definitely different from considerably weaker people where, uh, you know, if you're really, really strong, you're, you're probably going to fail, especially for things like squats and deadlifts, um, you know, just because you can't, you just can't produce the energy you need anymore. Whereas for weaker folks, it's, it's because the actual muscles give out. Yeah. So you're, you're reaching a different type of failure. Um, so yeah, that, that's going, that's definitely going to affect the number of reps someone can do with a given percentage. All right, the, I would throw, and I, this may have been in the first one that you were given, Techniques also plays yeah, a yeah. factor, you know, because I jokingly would always say if somebody can jump on a curb, they should be able to squat 400 pounds. If I put them in an area where all they could do is only move this way, mm-hmm. like some suit that yeah. will not allow any movement, that I don't know if the force equivalent's the same. It's just bullshit that I yeah, say, yeah. you know, but they should be able to, and that, that that's going to affect that percentage too. Mm-hmm. So to going back then to that person that's looking at these programs, what is that variance if we know what that is, you know, and how do they go about manipulating the percentages of say said program? Yeah. So there's, um, you know, there, there's like a practical answer to that question yeah. and just a, how crazy can it get answer to yeah. that question? Uh, so for the, the, how crazy can it get mm-hmm. answer to that question? Uh, there was a study looking at uh, like how many reps can people do at 70% of one rep max, and it compared uh, trained lifters to people with no training experience. So their one rep maxes probably weren't good to begin with, mm-hmm. who are also like pretty high level competitive runners. And the lifters, I think at 70%, averaged like 14 reps, something like that, and the runners averaged like 43. So. No, that's crazy. You know, so that that's yeah. that's kind of an extreme example. Yeah, yeah. But if you're dealing with people of, you know, similar training status, um, who are all reasonably good at the lifts being done, uh, I think I think you're probably looking at realistically kind of on a practical level, like a kind of twenty five percent range plus or minus. So if kind of the average at seventy percent might be a twelve rep max. Some people might crap out after nine. Some people might get 15. There will be outliers who get fewer than nine and more than 15, but kind of like a a 25% range plus or minus, I think will account for about 80, 90% of folks. Okay. I mean, that's a lot if you're talking 70% though. Yeah. Say sets of five. 